Morning, church. Morning. How are you? Um, I have a large amount to get through today, so we're going to get to it. Um, our scripture reading for today is from Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17 through 24. So if you want to turn in your Bibles, otherwise we might have it. No, we don't have it. Um, listen now to Ephesians chapter 4. Now this I affirm and insist on in the Lord. You must no longer walk as the Gentiles walk in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of their ignorance and hardness of heart. They have lost all sensitivity and abandoned themselves to licentiousness, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. That is not the way you learned Christ. For surely you have heard about him and were taught in him as, as truth is in Jesus to put away your former way of life, your old self, corrupt, corrupted, corrupt and deluded by its lusts and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, in the spirit of your understanding and to clothe yourself with a new self created according to the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. This is the word of the Lord. Some of you might know uh, the intricate details of my tumultuous childhood. And some of you might not know the intricate details, but you generally know that my childhood wasn't necessarily the best childhood. It was tumultuous. What? That's a new one. Tumultuous catastromomalous. That's what it was. The thing about my childhood is that uh, my lovely mother married an extremely intelligent and funny, but very paranoid and clinically diagnosed narcissistic and abusive father. They had my older sister and then they had me. And just like many marriages, there was conflict like normal, right? Except my family's conflict was probably just more violent than normal, abusive than normal, than most at least. You see, the trouble with my paranoid, narcissistic, what, what's up? I'm going to interrupt you for a second. And, and Haley made a mistake when she said she didn't want to interrupt you. Oh, the she kids. Said, she said, I don't want to infuriate Adam. <laughs> Are the kids? Instead of interrupt. So Haley is outside on the yard right now. So if the kids want to head on out there, they can go there. Go play. You want to go play? That's probably good because we're getting dark today. <laughs> <laughs> it's up to you guys. If you, if you, if you can't tell already. <laughs> I'm going... Carry on. <laughs> at your at your leisure, leisure, children, go uh, uh, experience happier, sunnier days outside. The trouble I had, the trouble with uh, my paranoid, narcissistic, abusive father is that uh, if you weren't all out, one hundred percent on his side, you were against him. You were an enemy. And if he couldn't attack or manipulate you, you were cut out. You were cut off. And that's, exa that's exactly what happened to me and my family. I had a father, a father who cut me off. Now imagine, if you can, a teenage Adam Jones. I know. <laughs> Not a pretty sight, but it gets worse. Uh, the teenage Adam Jones is this quick-witted, silver-tongued little a-hole. <laughs> I wasn't particularly good at school um, because I, I don't know, I had issues with authority figures. I wonder why. Um, I didn't really get along with them, and I was a particularly uh, big pain in the neck at school because I was witty and generally kind of intelligent. I was a smart aleck little a-hole. And uh, to make matters worse, I would be a thorn in the teacher's side but also be uh, like making the class laugh and like me. So I got everyone else to like me and them to hate me. And they were in a rough spot because of that. So thanks, teachers. Yet, as I'm sure you can imagine, my inner life, teenage Adam Jones, my, my inner spirit, the very core of my being, my heart of hearts was a mere shadow of what it should have been. I was filled with rage 
and sadness. Partly because I didn't have a father, rage. Partly because I did have a father somewhere out there in the world who very consciously and intentionally chose to cut me out, to cut me off. Sadness. And when you grow up like that, you start having these things that repeat in the back of your head, right? Inside the seat of your spirit, at the very core of your being in your heart of hearts. And these things that I had on record replay in the back of my head were things like you are unwanted, you are unloved, you are a bastard, you are alone. And then I went to Camp Gormley, a junior high youth camp during the summer. Camp Gormley was your typical summer youth camp where you stayed in a cabin with a, with a whole bunch of friends you made that week and you ate a whole bunch of food and you had a camp counselor who was usually just a couple years older than you in high school, and uh, you, you, but way cooler because they were in high school, right? And you, you ate a bunch of food and you played a bunch of games and you laughed a lot and you went to this thing called club. And club was generally like this more energetic church service at night. And there was a whole bunch of energetic songs, and then there was an energetic speaker uh, that you kind of went through. And, and, and the general progression of a summer uh, youth camp or, or a, a spring retreat, I used to lead these all the time, so I'm well equipped, uh, is uh, the general progression is you kind of meet and intro get introduced to Jesus, and by the end, you kind of work your way up to who he is and what he has done for you. On the last night, you learn about the cross, the death, and the resurrection. You learn about forgiveness, and you learn about unconditional love. Pretty classic kind of summer camp Jesus introduction. The trick was, is I had already been kind of decently acquainted with who Jesus was. So I wasn't bowled over by, by this, this week. But all of my friends were. So they were crying tears of joy and happiness and puddles of rejoice and sadness. And I'm like, yeah, this is cool. I like good, good, good work, guys. And I decided to take a walk. Because, you know, unsupervised kids. Good job, camp counselor staff. And I walk to the opposite side of camp, and there's this giant field, right? The game field or wherever. And we're in the middle of the mountains, uh, way, way out there. So there's no city lights to dampen all the stars. And I have the entire universe to look at. And I'm in the middle of this giant field, in the middle of a mountain in eastern Washington, looking up at the entire solar system before me, and that's when I first heard it. That was the first time I heard God speak to me. And he didn't ask me a question or give me a commandment. Uh, he just kind of stated a simple fact, and it was very like, this is a thing about the world. Like, the sky is blue. Just kind of matter-of-factly. He said, you are going to serve me for the rest of your life. And that was a pretty big turning point for me. That was when I stopped knowing kind of about God or who God was and started actually knowing God. There was a meeting there. There was a, a pivot point there. To be clear, though, I was the same person after that moment. I hadn't particularly changed any of my actions. I was still a snot nosed little, little a-hole that I always was, right? Teenage Adam Jones. But over time, I got to know God better, and I got to know God more intimately, more vulnerably, and I was more honest with God. And when you start doing that, God gets a little bit more vulnerable and honest with you. And he did with me. And that included some healing that I didn't know I needed. You see, I had a record in the back of my head on repeat, in the depths of my spirit, in my heart of hearts, in the core of my being, in my spirit of understanding, a record that was saying I was unwanted, unloved, and alone. Yet God had something different to tell me. God told me that I was wanted. God told me that I was deeply and unconditionally loved. God told me that I wasn't alone. God told me 
that he was always with me. God told me that I wasn't a bastard. I did have a father. I had a dad. But God was my dad. And for a teenage, smart aleck, little a-hole like myself, understanding in your heart of hearts that you are loved, that you are accepted, that you are not alone, and you have the best dad that anyone could ever have, that changes things. Which is funny, because I hadn't really changed anything. Again, I was the same smart aleck, snot-nosed kid that I always had been. Which brings us right to our scripture today, here in Ephesians. Yet I want to point out a very specific point up front. Starting, having, developing, beginning a relationship with Jesus does not change your behavior. Just because you know Jesus doesn't mean you act right. Okay? Amen? On the contrary, while changing often is included in having a relationship with Jesus, it is not the central point. It is not the condition to have a relationship with Jesus. The central point of change takes place in your inner world, within your spirit, within your heart of hearts. Change starts from the inside and then works its way out. Let's look at our text more closely today. I'm going to pick up in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17. Now I affirm and insist in the Lord, you must no longer walk as the Gentiles walk. First off, who are these, Gentile, who are these uh, uh, Ephesians that Paul is talking to? He just told them to no longer walk as Gentiles walk, but guess what? They're a bunch of Gentiles. This is the city of Ephesus, a Greek city, Greek word, Ephesians. They're a bunch of Ephesians. They're a bunch of Gentile Greeks. And he's saying, don't be them. But we are them. What? How does that work? No longer walk as the Gentiles walk. Furthermore, wait, isn't that a behavior? Isn't walking a behavior? Ha <laughs> ha Good point, church. But to you, I say, keep reading. So, must no longer walk as the Gentiles walk. In the futility of their minds, they are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of their ignorance and hardness of heart. This is all internal world stuff. You tracking? You picking that up? All of that. Verse 17, 18, and a little bit of 19. All internal world stuff. Futility of minds. Darkened understanding. Alienated from the life of God. Hardness of heart. Then we finally, in the last half of 19, get to behavior stuff. Check this out, 19. They all have lost their sensitivity, internal world stuff, and have abandoned themselves to licentiousness, internal world stuff, greedy, internal world stuff, to practice external behavior, to practice every kind of impurity. Church, it starts in the heart. It starts in the very core of your being. It starts in your seat of understanding. And God and the world starts there. It starts here. And then it works its way out into your behaviors and actions in the world and into the community and the world and those others around you. And this is where Paul gets really amped. Verse 20. That is not the way you learned Christ. For surely you have heard about him and taught in him as truth is in Jesus to put away your former life, your old self, corrupted and deluded by its lusts. Let's remember lusts isn't just a sexy thing. Lust is actually a, a word that means I must have it right now. So yeah, you can have lust for sexy stuff, but you can also have lust for Twinkies. Or you can also have lust to, I need to go watch this movie right here, right now. You can lust a whole bunch of stuff. Yeah? Put away your old self, corrupted and deluded by its lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your understanding. Be renewed in the spirit of your minds. Be renewed in the very core of who you are, your heart of hearts. And clothe yourself with a new self, created according to the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. I've told you all this story before, but I'll say it again. 
There was a, uh, a survey uh, about 30 years ago about with, with mainstream kind of evangelical Christians in America. And they were asked whether or not they would rather present the gospel to a prostitute and have them immediately stop practicing prostitution or have that prostitute have a genuine interaction and meeting with Jesus Christ and then go back to work the next day. Can you guess which one they chose? They were much more interested in like presenting the gospel and having and stop being a prostitute. They were much more interested in the behavior than the actual core of their being. They were much more interested in what they saw than in the seeds that might have been planted in the, in the depths of her, of her or her, his or whoever's heart. This brings us back to my very, very, very first point, if you can remember it. Just because you know Jesus doesn't mean you act right. This brings me to one of my favorite Jones originals. I don't have many of these, but this is one of them, and this is one of my favorites. It's less about what you do and more about why you do it. I'll prove it to you. Many of us learn that lying is bad. Amen? Yeah. But how did you learn that? We shouldn't lie. Most of us uh, have our reasoning behind that, is that we shouldn't lie, uh, and that reasoning is, is pretty bad reasoning. We either do it out of fear or we do it out of pride. For instance, your parents might have told you, you better not lie or else, right? You better not lie or else bad stuff will happen to you. You'll get in trouble. If you lie, the truth will come out and people will know that you lied. If you lie, you'll be branded as a liar and then no one will ever trust you again. Notice everything comes back to you. It's fear-based reasons. Don't lie or else bad will happen. Lightning will strike. At the very core, it's all about you. It's all about taking care of number one. If you lie, something bad will happen to you. It's all about the individual. Fear is used as a deterrent for this bad behavior. But what happens if you are 100% free and clear of ever being found out? Are you motivated to not lie? You've been conditioned and taught to look out for number one. Where's the motivation then? You're off scot-free. You're not motivated at all. You've actually been taught to look out for number one. So it's to your benefit to lie. The other option is, is pride. You might have heard, we don't lie because we are not that type of people. Liars are beneath us. Anyone who would actually lie doesn't belong with us anyways. Yeah? This also has everything to do with the self. It's all about us. We're better than you because we don't lie. It's all reinforcing. It's all looking out for number one, looking over, looking out for your own reputation. Elevating yourself above others. Let me ask you. Lying is still to your benefit. If no one's going to find out. You can't, there, there's, no, those, there's no motivation for you to not lie when it's absolutely to your benefit and it will never become uncovered. Lying is not a good behavior. Amen? But if you do it out of fear or if you do it out of pride, lying doesn't really get you, not lying doesn't really get you very far because you're still looking out for number one. Instead of looking out for number one, there's this crazy idea, and it's called becoming an apprentice of Jesus. And instead of looking out for you, you look to him. Every law, every book, every code tries to impart like ethical knowledge to you, especially the Bible. Uh, and and that tends to be what the Pharisees did. They tried to use the law and code to 
ingrained behavior in you. Don't lie because. And Jesus comes and messes everyone up and says, I don't care about yourself. Stop basing everything on yourself. Stop not lying because it'll make you look good or make you above your neighbor. Stop lying because I don't lie. I'm a part of a kingdom that is based on truth. Then you're motivated to, lie, to, to tell the truth in any situation, whether it's to your benefit or not to your benefit. Do you see the difference? Instead of lying, being motivated out of fear or greed, you're motivated out of gratitude to a person. Moral codes, ethical codes that you learn from books, texts, tradition, and culture, they're based on a text, they're based on a code, they're based on looking up for number one. Jesus does something crazy. He says, forget all that, base it on me. Base it on a person. No one ever does that. This is why the Apostle Paul gets in so much trouble or has such a, a big issue with the law because he knows the religious authorities of his day often use fear and pride to motivate people's behavior, to control people. And this is why Jesus pissed everybody off <laughs> because he based it on him, on God itself on the kingdom of heaven itself. You don't do bad things to look out for number one. You don't do bad things because your God is good and you are supposed to be too. Amen? God's love cannot be hindered. Jesus pissed everybody off because he showed up and immediately started healing people. And it didn't matter your state of uncleanliness. It didn't matter of your your state of social strata. You could be a social pariah. It didn't matter if you were the village weirdo. Jesus showed up and healed, spoke to, listened, nurtured, redeemed, forgave you, no matter who you were. Your behaviors are not a deterrent to Jesus. You don't have to act right to have a relationship with Jesus. God just shows up and starts loving, unhindered by our poor behaviors. Jesus shows up, and he gives us everything he's got. Jesus shows up and gives us his very life so that we might have life. Not because we earned it with our good behaviors. Not because we act right. Jesus shows up and just starts loving. Only after we truly get this does our behavior start changing. No longer are we motivated by fear or, or pride. Instead, we have, every, we have everything and it's all because of what Jesus has already done for us. We are, motiv we are motivated by gratitude. We're just overwhelmed with gratitude to even be there. It's like going to dance with the prettiest girl in school. You're going to open the doors for her. You're going to pay for dinner for her. You're going to drive super safely there and back on time. You're going you're gonna to give her your coat when she, she's cold. It doesn't really matter what it is, you're going to do it, and you're going to be so happy and thankful because you're like, why would you ever pick me? Is this based on my personal high school experience? Maybe. <laughs> it, didn't, it didn't make sense. Why this would happen, I don't care. I'm just happy to be here. Want a coat? <laughs> you're dumbfounded and overwhelmed with gratitude. You're just happy to be there. You know what I'm talking about? Church, when you are loved, when you are chosen, when you are healed, despite being a smart aleck little a-hole like me, you are overwhelmed with gratitude and you will go out of your way just to try to say a semblance of thank you. And in that state, you'll pretty much do anything with a smile on your face just to try and say thank you. Just because you start a relationship with Jesus doesn't mean you act right. But when you start a relationship with Jesus, or rather when Jesus starts a relationship with you, you're no longer motivated by fear and pride. You're motivated by gratitude. Church, I had a broken record in the back of my mind, in the heart of hearts, that I was unloved, unwanted, that I was alone. God spoke a new spirit of understanding into my life. God spoke to me that I was loved, that I was wanted, and that I was not alone. God told me that I was to be his son, and he was to be my father. He was to be my dad. 
and I have spent many years since in service to him because he loved me, because God chose me, because God spoke truth and light into my life. The fun thing is, is I'm not the only one. I'm just my example. Many of you know the story of Connie and Josh and how God completely turned them around with healing and love and acceptance and redemption. And if you don't like me and you don't like Connie and Josh, I can understand. <laughs> you have Mike. Everyone loves Mike. He gets up almost every week in prayer time, and he talks about the massive transformation that is taking place in his life. Amen? It's what God does, church. He takes the old self, and he allows us to take it off, giving us a new self, a new record to replay in the back of our minds that says we are loved and accepted. And I don't know what records you might have playing in the back of your mind. Some of you might have a record that says you need to be right. You need to be in control. You need to be behaving correctly in order to be loved. And if that's you, God might say something like, no, you don't. You're not right. You're not in control. And you don't have to behave correctly. You certainly can't justify yourself. And here's the crazy part. I love you anyways. I choose you anyways. You're my daughter. You're my son. You're mine. Some of you might be desperately seeking the approval of those around you. I just want to be friends. You want people to be happy, comfortable. And most importantly, you want people to like you. If that's you, God may say something like, who cares what other people think? I love you. I want to be with you. I want to be friends with you. You're my son. You're my daughter. You're mine. Some of you might be looking to succeed, to achieve. You might be thinking, if only I had, uh, get this next thing or accomplish this next goal. If only I had this one thing, if only I knew that everything that I had accomplished in my life was deeply important and purposeful, then that would, that would be enough. If that's you, God might say something like, it doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter what you've got going on. It doesn't matter what you're going to accomplish. I've already done everything that matters. I've died so that you may live. So by all means, start living. Better yet, live with me. I love you. You're mine. You're my son. You're my daughter. You're mine. So let's ho go have dinner together and enjoy life. Church, many of you have a bunch of crazy records spinning in the back of your head, in your heart of hearts, in the core seat of your understanding. And I don't know what they are. You might not know what they are. But I ask you, do you really have any right to tell yourself anything other than what God is telling you? I'm going to ask that again. You might have a lot running back here. But do you have any right to tell yourself anything other than what God is telling you? That you are his. And he is yours. The Apostle Paul pleads with the Ephesians to take off their old self and put on their new self. And so we should do likewise. Put on the new spirit of understanding. Put on a new word that God has given to you. Stop believing the lies that we tell ourselves. As Paul said, that is not how you learned Christ. Start believing the truth that God has told you a truth that might sound something like you are a child of God, created in the image of God, and unconditionally loved by God. Church, what a tragic week we have experienced. And the one thing that I want to make a real 
crucial point about is let's not be reductive about this. I don't want to be reductive and say that it's all about gun control or regulation as if that would solve the very distinctly American issue that we're under right now. I don't want to be reductive and say that mental health care uh, is, is the one thing that we could solve that would solve this issue. It's more complicated than that, amen? I also don't want to be reductive and say that uh, our little passage in Ephesians and my half-hour sermon today will solve this issue, because it won't. But I do think it has something to say to us. So many of us are wrapped up in an old self with old records spinning in the back of their heads and in their heart of hearts. And those records, I would venture to argue, are based on fear and pride. And let me ask you this. There is a new self. There is a new life. There's a new way of living that is available to us. And do you really think that if you replaced fear and pride with gratitude, that we would have mass shootings? Do you really think 19 kids would be dead if that shooter was overflowing with gratitude? We are this weird group of people that get together every Sunday to try and figure out who God is, and what it is that he has to give us. What if he has to give us a new life, a new spirit of understanding, a new word for your life that is overwhelmed with gratitude? Can we still live the same old life based on fear and pride, the same old patterns that get us into so much trouble? Can we really believe the same records that we've been believing, the same lies, if we have this new life? ready and waiting for us, if we have a God who's done so much for us that all we can do is respond with gratitude. This is the new self. This is the new life, and it is readily available to us. May we take it up. May we go live like it. Amen? Let's pray. Father, again, I ask today that you forgive us. Have mercy on us and help us as we enter into a really difficult, pretty uniquely Christian thing. And we, as a little group of people, on behalf of a larger group of people, just decide to be the bigger, bigger people and own it. And we confess. to the tragedy and heartache, to the fear and pride that motivates so many of our actions. Lord, teach us who you are and who you have created us to be. Overwhelm and flood us with gratitude, acceptance, love. Show us this new self. Show us this new life. And God, give us the courage to step up and put it on and take it and live it. Thank you for speaking good, true things into our lives. In Jesus' name we pray.